They refer to him as a pioneer, a trailblazer, and a fearless businessman. He started multiple businesses in South Africa's famous township Soweto during apartheid when all the odds and laws were against Africans. Dr. Richard Mapoy overcame all obstacles and broke barriers to build a thriving conglomerate of retail and property businesses which are still standing today and worth over 400 million. One of his names is uh, Richard Pelwana uh, Maponya. Internally, as family, he is the main pillar. Everyone comes to me and says, oh my gosh, Dr. Richard Maponya is this amazing person. I'm just like, you don't even know the half of it. When you talk about Pelwana, Pelwana means a small heart. Now you see a big man with a small heart. It was an oxymoron for me. You guys get to see, but I get to experience him every day. My name is Tabe Kalafeng, and tonight I'll be having a conversation with the incomparable Dr. Richard Maponya. Please help me welcome the man. You expect that. Thank you. <laughs> because you can see how much love they have for you. Thank you so much indeed. You are not from Soweto. You are from Northern Transvaal or Limpopo now. How does a, how does a young man from Limpopo come and take over all of Soweto, take over all of South Africa, take over all of Africa. I mean, how, what, what lessons did you pick up from your youth uh, in Limpopo that you said, this is going to stand me in good stead when I get to Soweto? As a young man, uh, I, I, I was a, the type of a guy who wanted uh, to tackle whatever kind of challenges when I see uh, my elders doing a certain thing, I always felt, well, I can also do it. I can do it even better sometimes. And of course, you've done it well. I mean, you've done really, really well. Yeah, but you started you. off as a, as a teacher. Yes. And you became a really successful businessman. I mean, why did you leave teaching? We always talk about the country needs teachers. Yeah. And you leave teaching. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, I was at school, I said, I, I always felt I would like to be a, become a teacher. And uh, I trained as a teacher. And uh, I came to Alexander Township to take my first teaching post in Alexander Township. A Alexander here? Yeah, Alexander Township in, in, in Johannesburg. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought, you, I thought you came here to make money. No. So you came here to serve the nation already. <laughs> <laughs> but just whilst I was waiting to, to be called in uh, as a teacher, uh, a relative of mine came to me one evening. He said uh, where he was working in the CBD, they are looking for a an educated black guy to look after a huge de departmental store. Uh, this company had a lot of customers um, amongst the blacks and, and the mining uh, in industry. Uh, then he asked me to, to, to go for an interview. What impressed me uh, was when uh, the people uh, who interviewed me, offered me a job, and they paid me six times more than what uh, I would be paid as a teacher. What, what teachers <laughs> badly paid then as well. Yes. You know, that is just a new thing. So, so. The, then I said, well, maybe these are the greener pastures one is looking for. <laughs> so, so, and teaching it was. Now, is this, the, is this the, uh, the business that you went into, is that the one where they sell clothes? Yes. So you started selling clothes? The gentleman who employed me 
Uh, Mr. Bolton, I still remember his, uh, his uh, name very well. Mr. Bolton uh, showed me the place and he said, look, this is what I, 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 I would like you to, to look after. It was a big place, very, very huge place. And uh, he wanted me to keep stocks and also mark up the, the, the prices of all the items that are there. And I bet you it wasn't small markups. <laughs> <laughs> so now you understood why you were getting such a big salary. <laughs> no. So why did you to, to do markups yet? You, you know, I did my job so well that in so well that, you know, in six months, this gentleman called me back into, into his office. He said, you know, I have never worked with a, an intelligent black person like yourself. Do you say black person or native? Well, what, uh, what language did they use those days? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, native well, well, what was the thing. <laughs> but, but, you know, being called a native, it was a pride to me because uh, he was at least recognizing the fact that I'm, the na I'm a native of this land. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, what I find interesting is uh, during the day you work for Mr. Bolson, you stock taking, you selling clothes, and at night you were selling clothes as well. You weren't <laughs> taking those from Mr. Bolson, were you? <laughs> <laughs> no, this came later. Was this later? Yeah, this, this came a little later when uh, Mr. Bolton uh, was uh, made a, a CEO of the, of the company because for two years he has been doing very, very well. We did so well because the, what, what Mr. Bolton did, he, he trained me to select clothing that are appealing amongst people of my color. And uh, whatever I, I selected was selling like fat cakes. Maguinha. <laughs> Maguinha. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I those. Uh, but what's, now what's interesting to me is you used to sell the clothes on pay as you wear. Yes. Were you not afraid that our brothers and sisters are not going to pay you back? <laughs> because they already won the clothes. During our time, things were different. People were, 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 were people, good human beings. They would never, ever rob you. Even if uh, the person changes in employment, yes. he would leave a, 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 an address where he's going. And when I get there, I'll find that he has got uh, my money in an envelope, and uh, he'll be also giving me referrals to other friends or relatives to, uh, to sell my, 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 my clothes. <laughs> but now, what was also interesting is, that is how you raise money to begin your big business. Yes. So it was a very pioneering way for me at that stage. You did not go to some bank for a loan. There wasn't anything that was called a loan during those days. As a black person, they would never give you a loan. A loan? <laughs> <laughs> they, they will say, leave us alone. That's <laughs> right. I'm not looking for you. He was married to one of the most uh, beautiful women, the late Marina Maponya who became like my second mother. Mrs. Maponya, Marina Maponya, as she was so affectionately known at that time, used to come in and we had everything we needed. There was tea, there were refreshments. It was, a, it was like home. It, it was basically, technically, it was a boardroom that was bringing one of the biggest uh, 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 endeavors and, 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 and accomplishments of the time. And then here was this homely and family setting that we all felt we were at home. You and, uh, and, and, and the late member Marina Okoya were the epitome of style. How does a guy from Limpopo meet such a fine woman? You know, uh, if uh, luck is on your side. <laughs> <laughs> 
Did, did, you, you, did you, you have to dress up for her? You'll always uh, pick diamonds or gold, you know. Because it's just part of your DNA. You know how to pick uh, the finest. <laughs> she, well, I was very fortunate, you know. Uh, I had a friend, uh, uh, Mr. Kruka. Kruka, it's not a Kruka, but because he was an Afrikaner. Hmm. He was a closer gentleman. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm waiting for Paul Kruger's uh, relatives. <laughs> so I wanted to know how they know fine black women. I didn't know they can look at. But yes, you met Mr. Kruger, who was and he was a relative to uh, to Marina. Ah. And and one day he said, "Look, I'd like to introduce you to my to my cousin." Uh, he introduced me to his cousin, and uh, I invited the cousin to to a dance. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the city, uh, we, we went dancing, and that is where now everything got sealed up. She saw, <laughs> she, <laughs> she saw your moves, and you made a move on that. Right. <laughs> so, but it was, a, it was one of those marriages and one of those partnerships that everybody looked up to. What do you, what do you say was the, in, what made it such a successful relationship and a partnership? Because it was a partnership, not just at home, but also <coughs> success in business. We never had any problem. We never had any quarrels. If at all we, we had some differences, we will never correct one another in public. Only when we are in our bedroom. <laughs> it was only then that we, we, we talked about uh, our problems. And then... Uh, if she's wrong, she was not shy to say, I'm sorry, my darling. I, I looked at it differently, and uh, I can see your point of view now. And also on my side, if I was wrong, I would say to her, I'm sorry, my darling. I did not see your point of view then. Uh, we were a wonderful pair of couple, uh, you know, if he can come back again, I'll still marry the same woman. <laughs> the 90s also brought a very difficult um, time in your personal life. How did Marina's passing affect you? Personally, from a business? Because you two were, as people like to say, joined at the hip. You empowered her and she empowered you. A big part of your life had left. You know, uh, when she passed on, I really didn't believe she's really gone. It took me a long time to believe that uh, she's gone forever. I always believed that she has taken a visit, she's coming back. But uh, she, she had gone for forever. Uh, I was terribly devastated. As a matter of fact, uh, I almost lost everything. Uh, Marina was my right-hand lady. If you leave Marina in business, it's just as good as you being there yourself. She was a wonderful person, and uh, she, she knew how to work with people, and she loved working with people. As a matter of fact, when she passed on, she had a, a, a note of monies that she has been uh, giving to people. When I looked at it, I said, I'm not going to ask anybody to, to pay that money because that is her wish of wanting to help. Of course, a great smart dresser. I'm a Palantine in those days. And uh, what was also important, he used to go to his shop uh, wearing a tie and a suit, looking very, very nice. In the 70s, he drove a, a car. At the time, I mean, it was their car. It was a, a valiant coupe, an imported car. During those apartheid days, Ndadema Ponya used to sit with white people where there was segregation, black and white. We all, as youngsters, uh, wanted to say, one day I'd like to be like him. So we knew that he was educated. He was a teacher at one time or another. I consider him a serial entrepreneur, one of those business people 
who's bold and ballsy and doesn't want to, you know, doesn't mind making his hands dirty. The very first day that I met him, he made a remarkable impression. This man has got an inner side of finely tuned steel and he has a sense of resilience and focus which is probably the backbone of his success as a business and societal leader. Now, you and, uh, and, and, and the late member Marina Okoya were the epitome of style. I mean, she was um, best dressed woman those days, and she was not best dressed among black people. She was best dressed in South Africa. But what impresses me mostly is she was the first African woman to be businesswoman of the year, not among black people. When we read in the newspapers, uh, we used to see you dressed up. You, do you remember, you used to have these flowers yeah. and those, uh, 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 those jackets, white jackets, blue pants, and uh, with your horse and uh, with your car. And I think, I'm not sure if BMW will allow you now, but you used to take out all those emblems in front and put in the horse. <laughs> when, because all my, punya, all my punya cars had horses in front. Yeah. And of course, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know you're one of the first black people to own horses and enter them in the <clears> July. <throat> Was it deliberate? Did you want to send a message of how you present yourself? Or was it just? You know, uh, we were a role model for, of our people. And we always believed that uh, the young people are looking on us uh, as successful people that one day they would like to be like ourselves. I had to live up to that uh, requirement because uh, I knew that uh, I was a, a, an inspiration to the young generation. And an inspiration way indeed. When you come back, you know, you talk about your ANC activists. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, our politics when you come back. I also want to talk about uh, your relationship with uh, Nelson Mandela and Oar Tambo uh, when <clears throat> we come back after the break. During apartheid, he, he bought uh, the first BMW dealership in the township. He opened a big dealership in a place called Zondi. So he was the owner of a two big dealership, a BMW franchise and a GM franchise. Now that's business at the highest level. Richard was um, one of the first African business people to be recognized by the prestigious Sunday Times Businessman of the Year. To everyone he's a businessman, but they don't realize how much of a family man he really is. Um, you have to see his face when the whole family comes together. He's just, he's, he can't stop smiling. When I see those insights from Gabby, from Ndaba, how does it make you feel? Because these are very successful business people, uh, you know, in their own rights. Right. And all of them, they look up to you and they say, it's because of people like you that they are who they are today. Well, you know, I really feel very humbled to uh, see uh, great guys like them uh, talking about me, yeah, I really feel uh, so humbled. Now, during the 80s, uh, a lot of companies were withdrawing from South Africa uh, as, as protests against uh, apartheid. You had Coca-Cola leaving, you had General Motors leaving. That did not worry you at all. It matter of fact, it gave you new energy. It definitely did, you know. I was the first uh, black guy to, to bring a General Motors product in Soweto. I was selling uh, Chevrolet motor cars uh, in Soweto. Uh, if you remember Mountain Motors. As I was driving here, I was driving and I was looking uh, just across the road from uh, Mandela's uh, Soweto house, across over there. I was looking, I said, that's Richard Maponya's uh, estate. Right. That's where he used to have his car dealerships. That's right. But when uh, GM uh, disinvested, we, we thought, well, th this was the end of it. Uh, we must abandon the, 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 the dealership. Oh, not you, though. Uh, you didn't think that way. No. It's not your kind of thinking. No, no. I, I, I actually 
left the, 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 the General Motor product. And then uh, I, I went in, in, into um, BMW motor cars. The first BMW that drove Mandela came from that dealership. But apartheid was really not a, um, as difficult as it was. You ran through it. I mean, you set up funeral parlors, motor vehicles, companies. You, how did you do this in spite of the laws? Because there were lots of laws. There was Group Areas Act. There was, you can't do this. You can't get this product. You can't yes, have access. Yes. How did you do this? Well, you, you know, this was, to, to me, a challenge. I had to do it because if I did not do it, I would have failed uh, my people. I was raided by uh, the system as if, you know, I'm selling drugs. They wanted to put me down. I resisted being put down. And uh, I beat them in everything they tried to, to, to put me down with. And as a result, here I am today at 96. Uh, I am still uh, running and uh, I am going even more stronger. Dr. Nelson Mandela and, um, uh, and O.R. Tambo, you had a very close relationship with them. They were your advisors. Are they, are they legal firm used to uh, be your law, your law firm? They were my, my, my legal advisors and they were my friends. Just before he was uh, uh, released, I went to see him uh, at the, the, the place where he was kept. I spent the whole day with him. Uh, at Victor Festel? Yes, Marina, uh, Marina and I went to see, see him there. And he said to me, Richard, I understand you're, 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 you're running a, a BMW dealership. I said, yes, Mr. Um, um, Mandela. And then he said, uh, they are talking about releasing me. Uh, when they release me, uh, do you mind picking me up in, in your BMW? I don't think when he went to jail, BMWs were around. <laughs> but then when he came out, he was not going to go for anything less, right? <laughs> when he, he, he got released, I didn't fly to Cape Town because I thought he was going to uh, get released, get into a plane, and fly to Johannesburg. But Cape Town people kept him for the night there, and then he came the following day. Following day, I was waiting for him at the, at the airport. I organized 10 BMWs, all of them chauffeur driven, and the one that was to pick him up, I was driving it myself. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very highly paid chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I, I, I came into Soweto, I wanted to put up a, a retail clothing store in Soweto. But it so happened that apartheid did not allow a, a black person to put up that kind of a business. I went to um, Mandela uh, Tambo, uh, uh, at tennis. I said, can you please help me get a license? Mr. Tambo opened the, the, the file. He gave it to Nelson to represent me in, in, uh, in, uh, in court. <coughs> we fought for the license. You know, that time Mandela was, 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 was such a fighter, and uh, he, he was such a powerful speaker. But it so happened that uh, it was unfortunate uh, we couldn't get the license for the, the, the clothing uh, business. But what they succeeded in getting for me was a license to trade, to sell what they call daily necessities. You know, they, they, they give you a, a control certificate and they itemize the, the things that you must sell. And if they find you selling asparagus or a fish, you are in trouble. They 
I will arrest you, and they, they will uh, uh, attempt to take your, your, your license away. I find it quite fascinating that you started Maponya Dairy Products, but you did not have a fridge or electricity. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, what were you thinking? <laughs> the milk was going to go bad. Well, it, it, you look around, you know, you say, hey, what is it that uh, our community need? I found that milk was the most important thing because uh, milk grew up children. And milk is a very important uh, commodity amongst people. Then I said, no. Despite the fact that Soweto is growing, there isn't any dairy. Then I said, I'm going to put up a, a dairy. And I started selling milk. You know, we had a, our, our, cooling, our cooling system, what was the water cooling system. What? <laughs> so where did you put the water? Between the bricks, uh, the, the, there is a, a, something that you, you, put, you put in. The sack? Yes. I think it was a sack, right? Yes. And you so, keep it wet. So, so that uh, as, as the water flows, it, it makes the, the, the room cool. And, and I think you used to use a bicycle to deliver. So you must have been quite fit in your youth. I started with 10 guys delivering uh, milk. Believe me, in six months, we had grown to 50 guys. Wow. Within a year, we were 100 guys delivering milk everywhere in Soweto. Wow. wow. When, when I was going through research for this, I said, this is an, he, 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 never, he, never, he never allowed any obstacle to stand in front of you. I took whatever kind of challenge. And uh, to me, there wasn't any obstacle. Uh, you must understand that uh, I was a young uh, ANC activist. And I really believed that if I failed, I shall have failed uh, the millions of my people uh, who are seeing what I'm doing, uh, because that time, nobody believed that a black person can be given a chance of getting into business and make a success of it. So you fought the struggle through business. Exactly. By being an example that you can, uh, that a person like you can succeed and an inspiration to others. Absolutely. You then served in the Urban Bantu Council. Why did you now get into politics uh, in Leboakum? You know, uh, this was through just a request from the community. I, I represented a, a lady who had 11 children. And uh, the, the old man passed away. And uh, what they did is this, that they said, the, old, the lady must uh, go back where she, she's born, and uh, they wanted to take her, her house away. Then I, I, I make representation for this lady. I took it up, and uh, fortunately, I won. And they, they got the lady back into, in, into the house. <laughs> uh, this is what uh, now caused me a problem of getting in, in, into uh, politics. It was through demand, request by the community. I, I, I didn't have a party. Uh, I was just on my own. They, they said, look, we will vote you. Mapunya National Congress. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this served you well because you then also in the 90s, in the uh, 90s, you then served in the first and second uh, Cordessa assemblies. Yes. So, you, so while you are not an active politician, I guess um, uh, uh, the ruling party and many other uh, community people really recognized um, uh, your, 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 your value and brought you into these conversations. Yes. Um, that was the most uh, interesting uh, time because when Mandela was still a, 
uh, arrested. And I asked him, I said, you are the commander of Kondo um, Ezizwe, and you are just about to be released. What do you want us to do when uh, you are released? He said, Richard, I want to take over the country as a going concern. I have millions of people behind me. We have lost a lot of people already. And this, the beauty of that you see in Johannesburg is the blood and tears of black people. It's our labor, cheap labor, that builds this beauty. I want to take it over as a going concern. Then I said, but how? He says, you wait and see. It was only when the Cortesa was created that I now understood how he wanted to take over the, the country as a going concern. He outmaneuvered the, the, the powers that be because they believed that uh, despite the fact that they had released him, they would still rule uh, the, the country for another 30 years. And it was a big surprise when uh, the people re voted Mandela with the numbers they did. It was a big shock for, 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 for their party their government. You, you know, most people, I think, are I don't know what the, uh, what, the legal, um, uh, what the legal limit is, but I think most people, when they're in the 60s, 60, 60, 65, they uh, start <coughs> thinking about uh, uh, knocking at uh, Minister Batabile's uh, office and say, when am, I, when am I picking up my pension? Um, not you. You went and put up a mega mall in the middle of Soweto. <coughs> That was an audacious move. That was a big move on your part. Well, indeed it was. I had a dream of putting up a mall in Soweto. Uh, it took me 27 years to, to convince the powers that be that a mall in a city like Soweto can work. I always felt that a mall in Soweto would be something that can change the lives of the people of Soweto. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what happened. Uh, Maponya Mall became a catalyst of malls being built everywhere in the country where there is a black township. It changed the life of people in the Republic of South Africa. It changed the lives of the people of Soweto. Uh, the, the mesh boxes, but, uh, houses, today they are worth a lot of money uh, since the mall was built. <laughs>
mohomana ra ho lebogela thobela you've traveled the world you've seen amazing successes you've dressed well you've driven beautiful cars you've made beautiful children grandchildren great grandchildren what else is there for you to prove you know i've always said for as long the lord has blessed me with health i must do whatever i can for my community i enjoy creating jobs i enjoy working and uh, helping people i have a lot of children that i've put to school uh, during 1976 when uh, the, the children uh, uh, went on strikes you know, you know during that time i helped 47 children I, I have i have a, i have some of them uh, in parliament i'm not going to be mentioning names <laughs> papa you've seen south africa through so many phases yes. you've seen it through apartheid you've seen it uh, through the triumphant um, uh, return of uh, of the of the anc from exile and the black led uh, successful uh, government and country you've seen challenges with the downgrades and all those When you're looking at the country, what is your vision or your hopes for the future of where we should go as a country? Uh, South Africa is a wonderful place. If we can only overcome racism and become one unit as people of South Africa, I would be I, I think we shall have achieved uh, one of the biggest milestones. And I would like to see South Africa that has got uh, good leadership, leadership that works for the community, leadership that says, my country and my people, uh, not a leadership that only works for itself. In closing, we have to close in an entrepreneurship point. In closing, when you started out, you, you were self-made. You created your own opportunities. You overcame all obstacles from apartheid to finances and all those. When you speak to young people today, and I'm sure they still come and see you, they all say to you, I can't get started because I've got no access to funding i can't get started because i can't get a tender i can't get started because um nobody likes me because i'm not connected that's not how you became successful what is your message to the young people today who are trying to become a success who are trying to become the next generation of the maponya uh, you know uh, when you talk about uh, uh, our youth you really uh, are talking of Uh, something that uh, uh, it's a it's a pain uh, on my heart. Uh, I always wanted to see our young people uh, being assisted. We have uh, thousands and thousands of uh, young boys and girls graduating, wanting to get into business. and most unfortunately uh, they are not being assisted i think here is where we failed particularly uh, when we had a, a black bank a black bank went under and it was taken over by uh, uh, white people and it it never served the purpose it's supposed to have served because when i created that black bank uh, I, th- i said this was a, a bank that was going to assist aspirant 
black people who wants to come into business. You know, when I, we, I, I do my travels overseas, I found uh, certain organizations in America in particular, they have a, a bank which they say, this bank, uh, it has got a, a risk funds. The, the risk funds that are helping the aspirant black people who have no security, but have a good business plan. They look at the business plan and then they say, this business plan makes sense and we're going to give you money. But we will take a 20% and, and mentor you. When uh, you're up and flying, uh, we will sell you the 20% back. Uh, it was a risk fund, but it wasn't just a giveaway for you to go and buy uh, Rolls Royce and Caddy Cadillacs. Uh, it was for the purpose of making you get in, started into business. Our, our, our government has failed to uh, start up a bank that should look after black people who have no security whatsoever, but they got a good business plan and they want to, 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 to get into business. Well, I imagine you'll say to them, persevere, <coughs> overcome the obstacles, think out of the box, because that is what defined you. That is exactly how I advise them. Uh, get educated, get trained, and never lose your dream. You may never lose your dream because it is that dream that can make you the person of tomorrow. Dr. Richard Maponya. Dr. Richard Maponya, pioneer, philanthropist, and a patriot. It's Thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with this generation for the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I can't even begin to tell you how much you've taught us and how much we love you. As much as we may not spend much time with you, but we love you so, so, so much. Papa, you are wonderful. We are thankful to all the people that acknowledge your work. And we too, as your grandchildren, are, are very proud of you, are very um, excited that people um, see the work that Papa has put in. And Papa, we just wish you many more years. Here's to 100 years in about three years, if I'm not mistaken. So, Papa, you are, yeah, the, the Dr. Richard Maponya. The last time that I've counted, you have eight children and 18 grandchildren. And now with your extended family of UJ, you have a further 20,000 students and 500 members of staff within the College of Business and Economics. And all of us would like, like to say from, from the bottom of our hearts, from our being, to you and your family. May this be one of the grandest and wonderful birthdays ever. Thank you so much for everything that you've done in order to set standards for the future that we can all live by. Kaleboa ntati, kaleboa. Are lubalam dukulur. So do we are to ya mawe chimawe chabu mapechiam tata fetlam tata wow. The passion you have for the youth of our townships and uh, your deliberate effort to, to try and uh, establish the institute will live on for as long as uh, I feel I have the mandate to continue with that. We share you with the world. You are not only a dad to us, you are dead to many people out there. Know that we love you always, we appreciate you, and we shall forever carry your legacy with mom. Go. God bless you, my brother. 
and keep you. I hope we keep on communicating with each other until God decides to call us.